OK. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes? OK. Th thank you. Uh, so uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, a very small uh, generic framework that I developed uh, to verified compilers. Uh, which was a byproduct of uh, the actual formalization I was working on, uh, which was uh, formalizing different uh, <clears throat> optimizations of uh, binary by of uh, bytecode for virtual machines. And uh, doing that, I had to perform a few simulation proofs uh, during uh, between the different uh, uh, languages, and then to perform some program transformations. And while doing that, I just tried to abstract away uh, as much uh, details as possible. And this kind of small, uh, what I call framework, emerged as a result of the, uh, out of that. So I just separated it in a, to a different project. And I actually submitted to the AFP at the one point at the beginning of the year. I think it was in February. <clears throat> and uh, now I want to uh, present you that a little bit and also uh, how I use locales as uh, building stones in this framework. And this was actually my first uh, introduction to locales in Isabel. And I had to, uh, there was a, a lot of uh, trial and error from my part. And I uh, reached this fixed point, which uh, works for me, but I'm far from being sure that this is an actual correct way of using it and because of some uh, problems that I will come to a little bit later. So we are in the context of uh, formalizing uh, the compilation from one program to the other. So we first need to define what the semantics of a program is. And to do that, we, have, we start with the static representation of a program. We have some kind of loading phase that will transform the static uh, representation to a dynamic representation, which can, uh, which can be executed. Uh, so the result of loading is the initial state, the initial dynamic state of the program. And we have a certain number of uh, steps. So we have a transition relation, which goes uh, from one st uh, state to the other until at one point we reach uh, one of possibly multiple final states. So this is general idea. The way I represented that in uh, Isabel is with different locales. So I have a locale for the semantics containing the trans uh, transition relation and the set of final states. Uh, so those are the parameters of my locale. I have in this, uh, in this one a single type variable which uh, uh, of dynamic states. And I have the concept of a language, which is a dynamic semantics and uh, this load functions. So I first import the uh, semantics using the semantics and uh, the local predicate. Uh, I decided to rename those uh, parameters because I will have uh, more of them later and this is, uh, I find it a little bit more readable. And then I fix my uh, supplementary uh, parameter which goes from the static representation to the dynamic representation. Uh, and this loading fail, uh, fa uh, phase can actually fail. So it's a partial function. And now the simulation. So assuming that I have two language, uh, two different languages, uh, two different programs, uh, and they can both be executed. So I first have to define some simulation between the initial states uh, of those programs. And then the simulation proof is gonna check for each step that one program does that the other program also reaches uh, uh, a dynamic state that is again in the simulation. So in this case, it would be in log step, but there could be uh, multiple steps on uh, in one language for what is only one step in the second language. But in the end, at one point, both programs should reach a final, uh, well, two final states that are in this uh, simulation. So the way I uh, model that in Isabel is with this backward simulation uh, locale. So I have a first semantics L1, a second semantics L2. So I instantiate twice the same semantics. So that's why I had to 
uh, add those prefixes here. Um, here I have this, uh, my, as new parameter, my match and my simulation relation, which I call max. Uh, this uh, uh, well-founded uh, ordering with the index, uh, this is uh, just a, an artifact of the formalization that I needed in order to exclude the situation in case of stuttering. Uh, I'm just not going to focus on that for the rest of this presentation. And here I have my two assumptions. So, so those are the assumptions that I, as a framework, that my framework expects that the user is going to pr uh, provide proof and prove. So that two matching states, uh, if two states match and the second one is a final state, then the first one also has to be a final state. And secondly, the simulation per se, where if assuming that we have two matching states, S1 and S2, if the second uh, program makes a step, then there must be uh, a way for the first program to also perform a certain finite number of states uh, before reaching uh, uh, a new matching state. And the other case here is just excluding stuttering. Uh, oh yeah, and this is the transitive closure. So the, the, this transition cannot be empty. And the compiler is basically nothing else than a function uh, from the static representation in the first language to the static representation in the second language. So here I export, uh, I, I import uh, first instance of a, an instance of a first language and instance of a second language. I assume that there will be some backward simulation between the, the two with uh, respect to some matching relation. And then I just fix the existence of this compilation, partial uh, compilation function. And uh, the, this function needs the property that if the compilation of a program succeeds, uh, and this initial program was actually valid in such a way that it can be loaded to a, a dynamic state, then so is the case for the compiled program. It can also be successfully loaded and the two loaded, uh, the two initial dynamic states are gonna be in the simulation. Thank you for letting me speak here at the Isabel workshop. Excuse me? I, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna continue. And uh, <clears throat> so, using this, uh, the this uh, these uh, this interface to the to the framework, uh, there are a few results that are automatically generically proven. And the two most important, uh, interesting one, are uh, the one of uh, partial correctness. So, in the context of a compiler, if we successfully compile a program and uh, both the uh, initial and the compiled program are, can be loaded to some dynamic state, uh, assuming that, this, uh, that the, second, the compiled program has some behavior B2, uh, which is not wrong in the sense that uh, if uh, this, the, second, the compiled program didn't crash, then we can be sure that this corresponds to some behavior of the original program and that those behavior are uh, equivalent for all intent and purposes. And the second interesting uh, property is that of compiler composition. So assuming that we have some compiler for some first language, uh, from some first language to, some, to a second language with the ordering, simulation, compilation function, and a compiler from the second language to the third language with uh, against uh, the whole machinery and the compiler uh, function then uh, we can automatically prove that the compiler from the first language to the third language will be valid for some uh, composition of the ordering in the simulation uh, with the, comp the uh, monadic comp uh, composition of the two compilers being uh, the verified compiler for, from the first language to the third language. And as I said, this uh, really small uh, framework came out of uh, the, my, the actual formalization I was working on, which was in context of uh, uh, optimization for virtual machines. 
And just a short introduction. So the idea is that we have some uh, three languages, uh, STD, Inca, and UBX. STD is our baseline. So some uh, stack-based uh, bytecode language, which uh, with uh, usual memory operation, uh, some control flow operation function calls, etc. And Inca adds an optimization for inline caching, and UBX uh, adds an optimization for working on unboxed data. Uh, and now I just want to give you an idea of what it looks like to use uh, this uh, framework by actually instantiating it uh, in the context of the Inca language. So I first start by having a certain number of uh, generic data types. Uh, some of them, uh, which I actually do use generically, so uh, well, actually most of them, so the function definitions, the programs, the frames, and the states are uh, data types that I reuse for uh, all of those languages, while the instruction, this is really specific for Inca, and I only had to uh, make it a generic data type because it's uh, not supported by local to define some generic, uh, to define some data types inside them. Now, in order to define my language Inca, I import a certain number of other, I, I instantiate in a certain number of uh, other locales that I uh, use to abstract over some implementation details. So I have this, for example, this local uh, of environment, uh, which I use twice. So one time to express the idea of having an environment of function definitions. Uh, I also have an environment of uh, dynamic memory and also abstract over this concept of uh, dynamic values. So I, uh, the Inca language doesn't actually know exactly what are the values that, uh, that uh, it, uh, it manipulates. Uh, there are only a certain number of requirements. So there has to be some Boolean, some concept of Boolean so that we know whether it's true or false, etc. And uh, so it is also for the concept of uh, uh, native operations. So uh, Inca doesn't know which value it manipulates, so it also cannot know what the exact operations are, but as long as those operations can operate on values, on those dynamic values, then everything is okay. Now, this is what I would actually want to express, but of course I have to uh, specify what are the uh, uh, constraints uh, between those types. So the type of dynamic values here is the same one as used by the operations. So for that, I add explicit uh, parameters for the different parts. So I have the parameters here for the uh, function definitions environment, for the memory environment, the val and operations. And here I only provided what is uh, one uh, set of minimal uh, type annotations in order to name uh, every type variable at least one so that I can use it later in my uh, definitions and type annotations. So here we can see, uh, uh, I don't remember, I want to talk, let's find this. So there are 17 parameters here, uh, but I only needed uh, five uh, type annotations. And now in order to actually define the language, uh, well, in the context of the local Inca, so I actually define the uh, transition relation which goes, uh, which goes from one dynamic state to the other dynamic state. The, I, define, I can define the final states and then this loading uh, load function from between the static program to the dynamic uh, state. And then I instantiate my different locales uh, by giving uh, the correct uh, functions. Uh, and then the same goes for uh, the other. Uh, okay, so in the context of a simulation, I, will ha I would have a locale simulation between STD and Inca, and then I would uh, import both STD and Inca, and then I would uh, prove the simulation and then sublocale uh, the simulation, backward simulation. And as a small uh, experience report, so the, the framework itself is uh, pretty small. So it's approximately 1,000 lines of code, uh, and it consists of basically the interfaces 
the, the locales uh, that I showed here, plus a few small definitions for so the definition of behavior and uh, small details like that. Uh, and then uh, the instantiation uh, itself is a little bit bigger, but it's also because it's for three different languages with two different compilation functions. Uh, but still, it's only 7,000 lines of code, so it's not a big formalization. And a few uh, nice properties that I learned uh, on the way with uh, about locales is, and is that um, it's uh, I really nice, I like the fact that it's a clear, explicit way to define abstractions. Uh, and that it enables me to uh, separate my concerns. So to explicit, uh, to separate, okay, what, what are the parameters or the, the operations that I uh, expect of those uh, on those types? What are my uh, assumptions? And then to separate the derived results somewhere else so I get that I can keep them separated. And also, which was absolutely necessary for me was the ability to uh, abstract over multiple states like uh, the uh, dynamic and static representations of programs, which wouldn't have been possible with uh, the obvious uh, alternative of uh, type classes. Uh, but then I had to fight a lot. Uh, the, my, a lot uh, my understanding of the usage of locals, especially there was a lot of syntactical overhead for the predicates, the extension, importation, uh, and type annotations. Also, the fact that uh, it's not possible to define a parameter a data type inside the locale that uses the the abstract uh, the, uh, the type variables, the fixed type variables of the locale, uh, and that is also not possible to just write a type al uh, alias. So, as we I showed earlier here, I basically had to copy paste a few times the same big types. Uh, in this case, uh, the state here here, here, and here, it's basically all the same thing. So I had uh, to copy paste a lot of type uh, for my type presentations. And also at one point I realized that there is a different syntax when referencing parameters uh, and derived definitions. So for derived definitions, I can just use the prefix that I gave, for example, for the uh, functions environment and the memory environment. But for the formal parameters, it's always through this explicit name that I'm giving when instantiating them. Uh, and this led to a lot of uh, syntactical overhead, which is, I mean, it, it's there. I, I did understand that it's there for a reason. So, and I think those are, at least for my usage, the main reasons. So they are there to avoid name clashes, where if I instantiate two locales uh, using the same param uh, name for the, uh, for two parameters, or if I instantiate twice uh, the same local. And it's also enables to express sharing. So if I want a parameter that is, will be the same for two different instantiations uh, of two different locales. Um, and the type, uh, type annotations also uh, are also necessary in order to name the type variables to use them further away. Uh, uh, so I initially started by always systematically writing the type annotation until at one point I realized that it wasn't necessary. And then I had just had to minimize the set of uh, annotations to, uh, to a minimum number that uh, enables me to name each type variable at least once. Uh, so this problem here was kind of uh, uh, reduced by that when I realized that. And also, as I said, there's the fact that the parametric data types, like for the states and the absence of type aliases, uh, that bloats uh, a lot of uh, my type annotations. And this overhead grows, actually grows with the number of locales, uh, parameters and type variables. So for example, uh, my biggest lo uh, locale for, uh, for now is the simulation between, between Inca and Ubix, and it is, um, contains 13 type variables, 27 parameters, out of which 11 are shared. So it's the, the more complicated the, uh, the locales become, the more I have to write in order to, uh, just for this kind of bookkeeping. And my strategy so far is not particularly smart. So I basically provide a complete list of uh, the parameters 
and then I search for minimum set of type annotations uh, that uh, in order to name those type variables. And then I basically just copy paste them from one locale to the other, at just adding uh, them one after the other, uh, the more my locales grow. And I'm not totally satisfied with the solution for now uh, because there's a lot of repetition. And when I dis uh, if I decide to change something in an existing locale by abstracting, for example, over a new type variable, then I have to go back in each of them and then adapt this set of minimum uh, minimal uh, type annotations. So I'm still looking for a solution in order to improve that a little bit. And I wanted to actually discuss that. So I was uh, tr I tried to come up with some possible solutions uh, and those ide are ideas that I had, but I couldn't find any way to express them in Isabel. So I don't know if it's just impossible or if it's just that I couldn't find it. So uh, one of the idea, so here is an example of what I am trying to express. So instead of, um, so you, uh, using this uh, local namespace uh, that I prefix here, fnv and mnv to avoid name classes, this is uh, name clashes. And this is already done for assumptions. So I can say fnv punk, uh, uh, some assumption, uh, m, mnv punk, uh, some assumption, and that will work. But I cannot say for the moment fnv punk get because I, I have to explicitly provide a parameter. So I'm, I tried to search a little bit, play a little bit with it, but I couldn't find a way to make it work with the, the parameters. But if it would work, then uh, it would uh, be nice to maybe just provide the, uh, the the set of parameters that are necessary uh, for the type annotations. So in this case of environment, I actually only needed a type annotation on this get function, which I have here the type. So if I could only write, hey, here is the environment and here is the, your constant, your parameter for the get with the corresponding type, then that would remove a lot of those parameters that I for now have copy paste and going uh, uh, one step further what I'm actually interested in is to express the sharing between the type variables so I have this idea that uh, in my dynamic values they have this type this abstract type dynamic if I could just say here just give me the, the standard names uh, for uh, the parameters, but use this name for the type variable, which uh, just happened to be the same uh, one that I'm using for the operations. Uh, well, then, if I was, uh, if I had the possibility to express that, either with, and this is some syntax that I just invented, uh, either with some uh, indexed, like positional uh, per, uh, arguments, or with some named arguments, like here. Uh, if it was possible somehow to express that, well, I actually wouldn't have to provide any list of parameters here because I would be very happy to just reuse the standard names and prefix them if necessary with uh, a local prefix that I would write here. So, and then I just try to count on those two examples of my Inca and my simulation. So if it would be possible somehow to achieve this, uh, just providing with one and two, just providing the necessary parameters. Well, I could get rid of 66%, like uh, two third of the parameters. And if I could just prov uh, provide the type variables when I could uh, get rid of all of them in this very uh, specific uh, situation. While in the simulation between Inca and UBX, uh, there it's different because there is a lot of sharing between the different imports. So the, uh, it wouldn't make a big difference if it was just specifying the exact necessary parameters with the type uh, annotation or just specifying the types because the sharing of the parameters would still require to be there. So I, what I'm trying to express is that I, 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 don't, I cannot think of any solution that would be perfect in all the cases. I'm just in search of some way to kind of reduce a little bit this overhead for common cases. And I'm wondering if any of you have experience with that uh, or suggestions uh, on the path going forward, because uh, this uh, simulation between Inca and UBX is my current biggest, but uh, in my 
um, uh, upcoming formalizations, I ex uh, expect this number of parameters to grow and grow and grow again, even more. So yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your talk. So we have time for a couple of questions. Thanks for this, Andreas. Uh, thanks for this very nice talk, Martin. Um, I can absolutely second your um, thoughts on um, locales, parameter names, and um, type variables, because I've experienced the very same when I build a similar abstraction in as part of the Jinja Threads AFP entry. It's just doing everything with uh, label transition systems, but the, the concepts are really similar. Um, what I've settled on with those um, type variable renaming problems is that I've given up on trying to find a minimal set of functions that I need to specify. What I rather do, I just have one of these big four blocks. So you have one of them where you said, oh, you only need to specify it for four or five. Um, yeah, uh, that one precisely. I just have the types of every function specified completely. And whenever I change something upstream, it's just copy and paste to everywhere, um, get it replaced. And this is the least maintenance effort that I had. So anyway, trying to minimize that felt like, well, if I then later introduce a new variable, I suddenly get into trouble with, oh, suddenly a type variable got missed in this minimal set of things and things got screwed up. So um, that's the approach I've been using for years now. And even so it makes your code base quite bloated. Um, once you go for the copy paste approach, then it's fairly easy to do. Um, of course, it would be nice if we could uh, get some help there, but this is my solution there. As for the type variables or data type definitions, not being able to reuse type variables that are fixed in a local, I think this is known for a while. Um, it usually bites me as well. Um, I'm still waiting on um, the big reforms in the underlying things to make that happen. Uh, having prefixes for variable names clashes basically with the underlying, uh, na uh, well, namespace or, or naming convention. So identifiers in Isabel, at least variables, um, don't have long names, so we can't put a dot in there. Um, and that's probably the main reason why we haven't that done there. And if Clemens is still around, I th always thought that it is possible to provide uh, local imports where you reference parameters by name. I think there's a where clause somewhere in the um, local documentation, but I'm not sure. Well, that's the case. Yes, um, positional and named instantiation. And that's in the ESRF manual, so just need to look at that, yeah. Okay, so I probably overlooked that. I can heartily recommend the name parameters. So maybe okay, as an add-on, what I've what I've also seen uh, as an alternative strategy to annotating a minimal set of a, uh, of parameter uh, of type annotations for the parameters is to have dummy parameters for the type variables, and then simply to annotate those. I'm not sure how this com comparison team comes up. So, so do you mean to add like some parameter at the very beginning, which contains one instance of every type variables in order to just have to provide this one? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, so, but in particular, if you use the itself type, then you can actually instantiate it with the itself type element and don't even need to fix it and drag it around. So this probably works as a workaround. So there were three low level technical issues here. And I think having explicit type arguments for locales is the easiest one of the three. None of them are easy, but I 
every time I pass by this implementation, I think so now I try to do this to have locale and then some funny notation for the type arguments. And then what Dimitri proposes would be just explicit type arguments. And we also need, can use this in other situations where you have polymorphic operators that you want to use at a particular instance. Uh, so if you just come up, yeah, we need a notation and then somebody needs to dive into that, uh, either Clemens or Florian Huffman or myself. <laughs> This will be the easiest one. The type abbreviations in a locale work in principle, but this will be a lot of work. And having qualified names for term variables, I ask myself this question every 10 years, and it will probably break a lot, but maybe in 10 or 20 or 30 years, it will be there. <laughs> so I have another command. <clears throat> One more thing, have you, uh, question first, have you tried to export code for your uh, locales or for your instantiations of them? Uh, no, I didn't uh, get to import some, uh, to export some uh, executable code. Because uh, that, that has been on my to-do list for quite some time, to be okay, honest. Because there you might run into another problem where you have to do another form of instantiation again, because right now when you want to export code, everything that is defined inside the locale, you have to define again outside the locale, which is again some repetitive uh, code that might or might not be avoidable. You mean during the instantiation? Yeah, when, <clears throat> when you instantiate the locale, then for everything that should get exported code, you have to write down an explicit defines clause. Oh, okay. Otherwise the code generator will complain about preconditions um, in the code equations. <clears throat> well, I think we should probably finish now. So we have a bit of a break and then we resume uh, at the hour. So I guess four o'clock Paris time. So uh, let's thank the speaker again.